They say that when you have Parkinson's, your voice uh, becomes a little bit dimmer. So can everybody hear me? A little bit louder. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Good, 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 good. Uh, I am really thrilled to be uh, participating today here at this Victory Summit. Um, as, a, as a Parkinson's patient, uh, I, I consider this journey a journey that we're all on together. Uh, and what I'd like to say is that my journey has been mindfully pivoted in a very positive way. The, the title of my talk is A Parkinson's Journey, The Art of Mindful Pivoting. And this is the act of mindful pivoting. Uh, I've been very fortunate to be part of this, um, this board uh, with Davis and, his, and, and the group here. And I have to tell you, it has been life-changing for me. This has been one part in, 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 a, in a step in what I call a successful mindful pivot. Uh, it's also a pleasure to be back here in Nashville. Uh, I was actually born not too far from here, and so this area has always been home for me. I was born in Newport News, Virginia. Does anyone know where Newport News is? We got some naval people here, don't we? Uh, but now I reside in, in, uh, in um, uh, San Francisco. Uh, San Francisco, in addition to being my home, is a home to many companies that have changed the way we live. I was thinking last night as I was at dinner with our faculty, I'm using an Apple phone to actually Google uh, the address of the restaurant, and then I was calling U Uber to get the cab. I mean, these are all amazing technologies that have changed our life. So these are companies that reside in, in the Bay Area, San Francisco, but not every company in San Francisco is a high-tech company. In fact, there are some low-tech companies. There's one particular low-tech company uh, that is, um, uh, it dwarfs in terms of age all of the other companies combined. Does anyone know what that company is? It's a low-tech company, originated during the time of perhaps the gold rush. Can anyone guess that company? Let me give you a hint. Yes, exactly. So I wore my uniform, my Levi Strauss uniform. It's a little dangerous doing pirouettes as a Parkinson's patient on stage, so I have to be a little bit careful. Uh, but what I wanted to say is this. I have a confession to all of you. And my confession is one that I am a very stubborn Parkinson's patient. But even worse, I'm a Parkinson's patient that has vanity. <laughs> and so I insist that all my life I will wear 501 jeans. 501 jeans, you got it, right, with the back part here, the red tag. So there's one part of 501 jeans that is still like the deep, dark secret, the dark secret, I'll say. Does, it, does everyone know that 501 jeans all have button flies? Now, you and I all know with Parkinson's that the bane of our existence is getting dressed. Is that right? Or getting dressed fast, I should say. My family's always waiting for me, right? Um, and so why would anyone in their right sane mind wear a button fly jean with Parkinson's? Go figure, right? It don't make no sense. Well, I'm here to say that, as part of this confession, that it's, it's my act of defiance in some ways. This is one of the little things that I can do, and I, we all have our own acts of defiance. And I ask you all to think about how do we channel that, right? Now, my kids, they tease me all the time. They say, oh, Dad's playing Forrest Gump again, right? You know, there he is with his fly down. And they sit there and they patiently wait for me, you know, an extra, what would take a, literally two seconds to pull up my fly, maybe even a, a second, takes me more like three minutes, to them it's an eternity. And so the more they give me a hard time, the more I get stubborn and the more I insist that I'm still wearing button fly jeans. I could switch any time, right? But there's something about this defiance that, that, that is, is part of my well, is part of my being. So. What, what, what I have to say is that we, we all have to have and channel our acts of defiance. By the way, I have a second confession. Uh, that, that confession is usually as I present, I ask people to look at my face, to, to hear my voice. This is the first time I've had 500 people actually look at my crotch as I'm on stage. <laughs> That's pretty unnerving, I'll have to tell you. So. What I'd like to do is, 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 as we go on here is, is talk to you about this club that we are. It's an unexpected club. I used to call it an unfortunate club, but it's not unfortunate to me anymore. 
And I've gone through my part of my journey to realize that it took me a while about to get there. Now, I've had the fortune of touring this country, talking to people about what it's like to live with Parkinson's for quite a long time now. And I'm not a star, uh, a, a, a cycling athlete like, like Brent or, or Davis Finney. You know, as a professional athlete, I'm not a movie star like Michael J. Fox. I'm just your average guy living Parkinson's like you all. You know, I'm Joe the plumber with shakes, or in my case, Chang the, the plumber, right? <laughs> but nine years ago, when I was first diagnosed, I went through the same sort of feelings. And, and you can remember that day when, when your doctor comes into the room and says, I think you have Parkinson's. You go through the range of emotions. You know, you go through anger, sadness, denial. I went through all of those emotions myself. But I do recall one thing that I told my, my I, I went and sought a second opinion at a movement disorder clinic uh, and, and was working with someone at Stanford who happens to now be a neurologist on our board here as well at the Finney Foundation. But I asked Dr. Bronte Stewart this question. I said, how can I get it more involved with my disease? And it was, she looked at me somewhat puzzled and she goes, well, what do you mean by that? And I said, well, you're the doctor, right? You tell me. But the thing was, she, she couldn't answer the question, and neither could I. Uh, and so the part two of this that, that was interesting for me was I, I realized that the onus was on me to figure it out. What I could tell her was I, I, I've been a biotech pharmaceutical executive for the last 30 years. Uh, and I've lived off volunteers, patient volunteers who volunteer for clinical trials with the hopes of trying to find a cure for themselves or their families. So in a way, there was a certain irony. I'd come full circle now. I was the patient. Um, and, but the question is, I'd seen these patients in action, but I didn't know how I was going to get engaged myself. So I sort of was puzzled. You know, I, I, I sort of scratched my head. Back then, I had hair. Um, and I said to myself, well, what can I do here, right? And, and for the first few years, I was somewhat lost. You know, I was aimless. I didn't tell, like Brent said, I didn't tell people at first at work that, you know, I had Parkinson's, so I sort of faked it a lot. You know, I sent people ahead to meetings and then I would join them late so that I wouldn't have to walk with them. Um, these are the kinds of ways that I, that I had not really truly accepted my disease. So I started thinking a little bit and I had an aha moment one day when I was, when I was taking my, my son to karate class. I used to also train in college uh, pretty aggressively in, in, in the art of martial arts. To, to try to figure out you know, my own life. And um, what I had said, so one of my, the, in, the, in, the, in the hierarchy of karate, there's one of the, the highest masters, or, or they, they call this master a sensei or a teacher of, of, of martial arts. My sensei said to me, Kevin, you, you're great, but you're mechanical. You're mechanical in your actions. And he said, what you need to do is learn to, in order to gain control, you must first lose control. Now, let me repeat that. In order to gain control, you must first lose control. That, there's a lot of meaning to that. Uh, and I, at the time when he said it, I, it didn't really register. But over time, I started to understand that, in fact, all, all things in life are exactly the opposite of what you think when you're skiing, when you're doing other sports. You, you tend to, the fight or flight syndrome, you tend to like tighten up. But the true way to accept something and master something is in fact to let go, to relax, to just flow with it. It's kind of like the Aikido where you just are sort of flowing and redirecting force. And so I started applying that to things in my life back then, mostly sports, but then I started doing it with jobs. Every time I took a new job that was different, I had to relinquish control. And that was part of my success. So now I was thinking about how can I apply this to the world of Parkinson's. Now you're looking at me somewhat dumbfounded and say, Parkinson's is actually a situation where you actually have already lost control. So you're asking me now to lose control more? Um, and I will say this, it's not easy. It's not easy, and I understand where you're coming from. But the first step that I found in this true mindful pivot was in fact fully re relinquishing denial. And by doing that, my life sort of began to open up. And so things started happening at that point in time that really changed my life. It allowed me to do much more. Um, and so what I'd like to do in my remaining minutes here is to talk to you about my five steps. First, beginning of losing control to gain control. That's step one. 
Step two is building your dream team. You're not in this alone. You know, you're constantly, it's, it's like building a sports franchise, right? You're constantly trading players, trading people in your life. Well, this is the same thing that you now have the ability to do um, uh, in your daily lives with Parkinson's. It's your physicians, it's your trainers, it's your rock steady boxing coach, it's your, your yoga instructor, it's your meditation. These all become the fiber of your dream team. So make that dream team, it's the act of control. You control who you want to be around with. Your caregivers are, are again, you know, for me, this idea of, of just being able to give someone uh, a bag of peanuts that I couldn't open. In the past, I would be angry. I would just give it to them now. Now they would open it for me, and they would say, I didn't realize you couldn't open that. That was, a, that was an aha moment for me as far as building my dream team. The third part on here is advocating for yourself. Only you know that you, you can wake up in the morning feeling great, and then at 4 o'clock you're saying, why am I so tired, right? I mean, we, we get this. We know that we, we are not consistent people anymore. So you have to advocate for yourself to go for it. It takes a lot of mindful training. It doesn't come easy, and it comes day by day. But if you train yourself to advocate for yourself, you'll find those aha moments, um, sometimes once a month, sometimes once a week, maybe even once a day. And to me, that's striving for that journey of, of, of finding those aha moments uh, as you advocate for yourself become part of the essence of really living well with Parkinson's. So the fourth point out here is to now be active and not passive. Uh, Davis says things like, uh, we don't have time to be passive. I have to agree with that. Uh, in my act of being active, uh, one of the things that I elected to do early on in my disease course was to, was to seek DBS therapy. I'd read a, a paper by David Charles here at Vanderbilt that talked about early inter intervention with DBS. And so I went to my, my neurologist. I'm, I'm, I'm the worst patient in the world. I, I read a lot, and I bring those papers to my neurologist. It's sort of like the, a, a doctor's nightmare. And I said, what about me? Do I qualify for early intervention with DBS? Um, I am so glad that I did this, because at the time, it, it was a little bit, uh, it was a little bit feigned, like, wait till, save that for late, late stage. You know, use, hold something in your back pocket. Today I can tell you I'm completely off meds. It's a wonderful thing. Nine years out I'm skiing, biking, not as good as I used to be, but I'm still doing it. So there was something about that decision that really, really helped me move in, in my direction. And I wouldn't, it would not have happened had I not advocated for myself. So I'm, I'm going to come to the last, oh, and, and, and with part of that I'm now involved very actively in clinical trial work. I volunteer for every clinical research trial that I can get myself into. Part of that embraces me with my, my, care, my, my, my medical team. Um, so I've become part of the fabric of their labs every day, which has, for me, been really wonderful. So the last closing comment that I will say is step five, and that is leave a legacy, your Parkinson's legacy. Now, I'm not exactly sure what that means because I'm doing it every day. But I do know that by, by, by thinking about going beyond just myself and helping others, I actually help myself. So I found myself last year uh, testifying at the, in front of the FDA as a pharmaceutical guy, as, now as a patient, on what it was like to live with Parkinson's. That was a mindful pivot for me. That was a great day for me. Um, last month, I was with Michael J. Fox over at Capitol Hill uh, talking to our congressman about affordable care, to talk about you know, pre-existing conditions, innovations in NIH grants, caregiver you know, policies. These were all things that I was able to really get involved with. And so I, I took what used to be my microcosm of just me to now thinking about a bigger world. And I have to tell you, that just makes my days even better uh, in, in there. Uh, I've, I've become involved in many other organizations. But I will say that my proudest moment has, has been working here with the Finney Foundation because what they do is, is what exactly what we need. As everyone in this room, it's not about finding the future cure. That's great, but it's also living quality life today. And this is what this organization has done for me. So what I would like to say here in, in, in my closing seconds is don't be afraid to reach out. Don't be afraid to mindfully pivot and find inspiration in the people around you. 
because the person that you just gave that victory salute to may be the person that will, you, you'll call on. In my rock steady boxing class, there's a 70-year-old man, Jerry. He calls me every time I don't show up at, at class. And mostly it's just, it's just to say, hey, I was thinking about you. You know, why weren't you there today? And if, if, get your ass down here, right? <laughs> I have nothing in common with Jerry other than my Parkinson's, but that's enough. So what I'd like to say here is look around the room. You're not in this alone. They're the Jerry's in your life that, that you, you have. You need them. They need you. We all need each other. It's all part of our mindful pivot. So thank you very much for your time and attention. I'll be here for the rest of the day, and hopefully we'll have a chance to chat and get to know each other better. Thank you so much.